Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Tom Higby, Professor of Special Education at Utah State University and Director of the ASSERT Autism Program. Broadcasting from my temporary home office today, I'm really happy to be able to talk with you about a project that my colleagues at ASSERT and I recently completed that we think will be a benefit to you uh, as practitioners, parents, during this crazy time. Uh, over the past few days, uh, my team and I have developed a tutorial that will allow you to create a digital activity schedule using freely available software through the Google platform. And so today I wanted to kind of frame uh, what this software can do. And then one of my colleagues, Cassidy Reinert, is going to walk you through this tutorial that we created and demonstrate how it can be used to improve independence, uh, help your kids learn to better manage their time, and hopefully increase engagement and, and keep everybody engaged in positive, proactive learning activities during this time when services may be temporarily interrupted. So just a few basics about what this technology can do. Uh, a photographic activity schedule is a tool that my research lab has been using and exploring and developing for over 10 years now. Yeah, we find it to be a fantastic tool to help because its main goal is to promote independence. And that's really what we want for everybody is to be able to work, play, interact more independently. And so photographic activity schedules are really well suited for that. They've been shown to decrease the need for adult prompts and allow uh, individuals with autism and related disabilities to complete activities on their own, essentially using the visual cues provided in the schedule to prompt themselves instead of waiting for some adult to tell them what to do. So we think that makes them ideally suited for this current situation where there are fewer adults around to provide those directions. So I'm a huge fan of activity schedules. Cassidy is a huge fan, and hopefully we're gonna kind of project some of that enthusiasm as we go through this tutorial today. So, just a few basics about activity schedules if you're not familiar with them. Um, and in the paper, uh, which you'll have access to as a companion to this video, there are some references that you can look up that'll give you more details about activity schedules. And if you have any questions about how to run activity schedules, we would we'd love to chat with you. Just send us an email and we can set up a time to talk or we can exchange information via email, okay? So the first thing when setting up an activity schedule is going to be important is creating an environment that's conducive to learning. And how we'll typically do this when we work with the younger kids, we'll typically focus on play activities too. Uh, and at the beginning, these activities will be closed-ended activities, meaning that they have a clear beginning and a clear ending. So we'll typically select two or three activities that the child already knows how to do <clears throat> that are at least medium preference activities but not that jackpot high preference activity that, that, that they're not going to want to stop doing because the point of an activity schedule is to help them learn how to transition between different activities. So these activities we'll select will usually be pretty brief, um, closed ended, meaning clear beginning, clear ending, uh, things the student likes to do but aren't that jackpot high preference activity. Uh, so usually two or three of those and then followed by a what we call a terminal reinforcer, which is usually some kind of reward, oftentimes preferred snack, just because that's an easy to consume and you don't have to ask for it back. Um, Cassidy will talk more about that uh, in the tutorial portion of this video. And then also you're gonna have added benefit, uh, Cassidy is going to model some of uh, how we do the teaching procedures uh, using uh, a volunteer that will be named later. The cool part about activity schedules, they can be used in multiple environments. And the research shows that these things, uh, they actually started out uh, being used as a tool to help adults uh, with leisure activities, self-care activities, employment uh, activities, pretty much any task that's a multi-step task or any series of tasks you could put into an activity schedule. When we're teaching these play schedules that we'll often do with our younger kids, we'll typically do those in a specific area. Usually we'll have a designated desk or table, uh, and then there might be a shelf where we put the materials, the, the toys and games, the puzzles, shapes, sorters, et cetera, on the shelf. But if you're at home 
um, doing this at the kitchen table would be a great location because the table is large enough that you can put the materials on one end and still have an open workspace on the other. So that would be my suggestion. It could also be done on the floor. Um, just kind of the idea is to set up the environment in a way that minimizes kind of transportation time going back and forth between the activities so that the focus can be on following the schedule. And then once the child learns how to follow the schedule effectively, you can then introduce greater distance and put things in different locations. But at the beginning, we like to kind of make things as easy as possible for the child. And so we'll have everything kind of in close proximity without a lot of distractions around. Now, when we say following a schedule, this is what we mean. Uh, and Cassidy will demonstrate this later in the video. Essentially, what we teach the child to do is open the schedule. So in this case, for our digital schedule, it would be opening uh, the application on the, the tablet or whatever digital device you're going to be using. Um, and this might be at the beginning a step that you do. You open up the application so that the schedule is there on the first page, which would be kind of a picture of what uh, uh, the first page of the schedule. <clears throat> Then they're going to open. Uh, then they're going to touch the picture of the of the first activity in the schedule. We teach that as a, we call it an observing response, kind of just to make sure they're paying attention to what the materials are cueing them to do. Then step the next step is they're going to go get the materials necessary to complete the activity. They're going to complete the activity. When the activity is finished, they're going to put the materials back where it goes. They're going to turn the page on the digital activity schedule by tapping uh, the advanced arrow that's in the lower right hand corner, bottom of the screen. And then they're going to keep completing that sequence of touch the picture, get the materials, complete the activity, put it back, turn the page until they get to the very last page, which is that terminal reinforcer, uh, after which they're going to put the schedule back or hand it back to you potentially as the parent. How we get kids to follow these schedules is by teaching in a very specific way. Uh, the purpose of the activity schedule is to remove the adults from the equation. And so in order to do that, we have to provide our support or what we call prompting in a very specific way. We don't use any verbal instructions. The only verbal instruction we'll give will be at the beginning. Here, here's your schedule. Go do your schedule. Complete your activity schedule. And then that's the last thing we're going to say until the activity schedule is over. We're going to teach them to follow the schedule using physical prompts that are delivered from behind. And again, Cassidy will demonstrate this later on in the video. The reason why we do this is if we start giving verbal instructions, then the child is looking back to us when they get stuck and want to know what to do. And all of a sudden, we just put ourselves right back in the schedule and defeated the whole purpose of the schedule. If we deliver physical prompts from, from behind the students who are standing beside, behind our learner and just gradually guiding them to complete the individual step using this uh, process called graduated guidance where we'll start with kind of hand over hand prompts uh, and then as they don't need that much support we can move to the wrist to the elbow to the shoulder etc and gradually reduce those prompts but by prompting them from behind physically like that they're still seeing all the visual cues that should be controlling their behavior and what's really interesting is those physical prompts are actually much easier to fade, we call it, or gradually reduce than are those verbal prompts. And so it's easier kind of us to fade into the background and let the child become more and more independent using those physical prompts. So that's absolutely critical as you're teaching your learner how to follow the schedule, that you're not giving verbal instructions, you're not making eye contact even, you're not using gestures, but only physical prompts. That's the strategy we're going to use to teach them to follow the schedule. When a student makes a mistake, and the idea too, where the idea is to try and prevent mistakes. And so we might even provide more support at the beginning than we think is necessary for the child to follow the schedule so that they don't make mistakes. But if they do have to make a mistake, the type of mistake will determine what kind of error correction we use. Now, if they're just in the process of completing the activity and they start to self-stimulate with the puzzle pieces or do the activity wrong, just step in and block that and guide them to do it correctly. But if they, for example, touch a picture and then go get the wrong materials, what you're going to do is you're going to bring them all the way back to the schedule, have them touch the picture again, and you're going to guide them to get the correct picture, get the correct materials so that we make sure we link that picture with those materials uh, and don't end up building this chain of errors. Okay. Um, so prompting and prompt fading is, is absolutely critical. Uh, and Cassidy is also going to show you in the tutorial that there, we started, like I said, with these basic components, closed ended activities, but we want to then go on to adding more complex components like teaching the students how to make choices 
And so how that will happen is we'll have a page that has two or more options that they can select from instead of just the static single picture that's been on the pages. And we'll teach the kids to touch the, to make the selection of that uh, choice and then go and do those material, get those materials and complete the activity. We also have ways that we can teach the kids how to, uh, uh, where we can use, teach the kids how to use the schedule uh, to complete open-ended activities that don't have a clear beginning and ending, things like playing with figurines or trains or basketball or whatever. Um, essentially, we teach the kids how to use timers, and there are steps in the tutorial that will teach you how to create timer pages. Uh, and essentially, we teach the kids to set their own timers. And so what they'll do, we'll use uh, visual cues to indicate the number of minutes and a start and stop, typically red circles for the minutes and green circle for the start and stop button. And then we'll teach the kids using hand over hand prompting again uh, to touch each of the so if, for example a three minute timer would have three red circles followed by a green circle we'll teach the kids to touch the green dots under the picture and then the green button on the timer which sets it a minute uh, sorry the red red to red minute two minutes three minutes the green button which is start and stop and then they can go do the activity for that amount of time and when the timer goes off, we would physically prompt them to turn the timer off by touching, again, the start, stop button. Okay, so we can add open-ended activities. Super cool once the kids get the basics of following activity schedules. Um, it's really important that we can attract progress on the activity schedules to know that the student is uh, making progress. And there are some uh, examples in the, the document that will be provided that uh, contains some examples of data collection and how you might do that. Uh, and that's something that uh, you can also get some guidance from from your uh, behavior analyst provider. Okay, so with that uh, introduction, <clears throat> I will yield the digital floor to Cassidy and she will take you through the steps of uh, making a digital activity schedule and then demonstrate how you would do the teaching procedures that I've been kind of outlining. So thanks for your time and for paying attention, and we hope this tool will be useful for you uh, as we work together to improve independence. Hi, I'm Cassidy Reiner, the clinical director of the CERT Autism Program. As Tom said, we have created a paper and a task analysis describing how to create a digital activity schedule using Google Slides. The paper is being published in the emergency issue of Behavior Analysis and Practice. We have included a link in the paper to the paper in the comment section below. In the paper, you can find step-by-step -step instructions on how to create a digital activity schedule template. I'm gonna walk you through that template, um, as well as a few activity schedules that I created using the template. I will also show you how to navigate within the schedules um, and um, model some prompting strategies that we use to teach activity schedules. First, I'm gonna show you what a digital activity schedule looks like. The first page in the schedule is the cover page. Um, and then the next page is a close-ended activity. Um, these activities have a clear beginning and end. At the bottom of many of the pages, you'll see these navigation arrows. And I'm gonna walk you through how to create those as well. Um, it's important that none of the slides transition when we are um, clicking anywhere other than the picture. Like Tom said, when we um, teach kids to do activity schedules, we prompt them to first touch the picture, then retrieve the items. So when we click anywhere other than the next button, we shouldn't see a transition for these simple pages. Um, this is a little bit more complex page. This is a choice page. And um, you can see that there's four different items that the kid can choose from. And when they make a selection by pointing or touching on it, um, a activity will appear down here. They would then touch the activity and complete that one. This page also transitions with the next button. These pages transition a little bit differently. Um, so we also discussed a little bit earlier um, how to set a timer in activity schedule. Um, we just use these red and green dots and they correspond with these um, buttons on the timer. So for a kiddo who's setting a three minute timer, the sequence would look like this. They would first touch the um, red dot, then the timer, then the dot again, timer, and so on until they started the timer. So for these digital activity schedules, we just have a YouTube video in place um, that runs for three minutes. When it's done, 
um, you will then push the next button when the timer is up. On this last page, there's a terminal reinforcer or a snack. Um, then they would return the treat bin to the shelf before they transition to the next page. And then this last page would signal that they are completely done with the schedule. Okay, now I'm going to show you a little bit about the navigation tools within the schedules. So um, these little arrows down at the bottom, when you click on them, um, to create this arrow, you would just draw in an arrow using the shape tool, and then we can create links to other pages within the schedule. So if you right click and come to this link, it will say um, that you can link it to somewhere else in this presentation by clicking on this. And then for all of the ones that are arrows, most of the time they're just gonna go to the next slide. So you can press next slide. And then when we hover over this um, drawn in arrow, it will say next slide. And then for the rest of the page, we don't want it to transition anywhere. So we're gonna actually draw a giant rectangle over everything and then link it like we did before with the right click to the same page that it is. So you can see this one says student's name page and that means that when they click anywhere other than this arrow it'll transition only to that page so they won't actually transition to anywhere different. Um, the navigation is a little bit more complex for more advanced activity schedules like a choice page. Um, this one you'll create four different pages and they will all have similar navigation so they should all have a next um, uh, navigation tool and the way that you can create this is after you've created one you can then go back to your other slides that have the five pictures on it and copy and paste it and they should all transition to that same location which would be the next page after all of the choice pages um, like I said, we have step-by-step -step instructions in the, um, the paper, and that is much more concise um, than looking at it in a video. So um, on these pages, each one of these pictures will then link to a page. So I'll show you how to do this one. So this picture should be linked to this page over here. Um, so for this picture, I'm going to right click on it. I'm going to go to link either in the right um, click or I can just go insert link up here on the toolbar. And then I'm going to transition it not to next slide. I'm going to say transition to slide four and then go apply. So now in my presentation, if I'm on that page, I can click on that and it would take me straight to that activity as a big picture. Um, navigation for the timer isn't much more complex. Um, for the first three pages where they're pushing the um, red dot, you would create a similar slide that every time they touch the dot on the timer, it would transition to the next slide. The other thing that you add in for each slide is you add in a different timestamp. So that one is one minute, the next one would be two, and then following um, two would actually be three. So this one says three and this one's hidden behind the other timer. So the last one that you would click would actually be this green start button, which would transition you to that page. So this button actually is just a screenshot of that same location and just put in like a picture on top of that, um, that page. So that is a template of how to create an activity schedule. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple other schedules that are more and less complex. So this is the most simple form of activity schedule is just three close-ended activities. So you can see um, this presentation is, would just start with these little ring stackers. Then you would come to a matching activity, a lacing card, they would then get their treat and that's their entire schedule. When we're starting with activity schedules, we definitely start with these close-ended activities. Um, then the next step would be adding in a choice activity. This is a um, mixture of choice and uh, simple close-ended activities. 
So then they would make a choice. They wanted to do that puzzle. And then they would move throughout the rest of the slides. So this is um, really similar to the other as the, all the activities are close-ended activities. And then this would be the most or more uh, more complex schedule. Um, it has close-ended choice and timed activities. Um, as you can see, um, all of these schedules have the activities in the same order. We wouldn't typically do that. They would be um, rearranged and reordered as often as possible so that we're not just teaching um, rote memorization of steps in a task. We would teach them to follow the schedule. When um, the schedule is ready for um, your client or your child to use, um, you can set it up on a tablet or a phone. Um, some phones and um, tablets, you'll need to download the Google Slides app to them before they work. Um, but then you would just come to this present um, button at the top and then um, that would be how that they how they would view it on um, the different devices. Um, also, if they can use a mouse, they could do it on a computer as well. Um, all right. So the next thing I'm going to show you guys is some prompting strategies within Activity Schedule. In the first video, you'll see me prompt my son um, to touch the picture and to retrieve the correct items. Time for activity schedule. In the second video, you'll see me prompt my son um, to select a choice activity and to set the timer in the schedule. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or you want more information, please um, check out the comment section below. Um, you can find our website and you can also find the link to the paper there. Thanks.